Morning, everyone. Uh, so I've been given like a lot of instructions on where to stand and where not to stand. So I may just get down there uh, as soon as I forget. Um, <clears throat> so I'm excited to be here to, to address you guys for any number of reasons, but I, and I'll share share why. Uh, but I, I did want to explain sort of the title of this uh, talk. Uh, why isn't open data in my neighborhood? Uh, it came to me. I lived in Chicago for a while um, before coming back to New York. I'm born and raised in New York, uh, Brooklyn. I lived in Chicago for a while, and I was reading the news about uh, the two-year-old that was killed uh, 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 by, uh, by a drive-by shooter who shot into the car and was going to shoot uh, uh, her father. Um, and then she was uh, shot and killed. This was maybe two, three weeks ago. I don't know, some Chicago folks in the audience. I think it was two, three weeks ago. And it was very profound for me that, you know, I used to work at Motorola back in Chicago. I left Motorola to go pursue my doctorate because um, I was living in Chicago at the time of 9/11, and right after, right when, um, on 9/12. Um, uh, what I was doing at Motorola on 910 was the same thing I was doing at Motorola on 912. And I said to myself, if my job doesn't change when literally the world changes and transforms right in front of our eyes, uh, then that must mean that I don't have an impact. If my job doesn't have an impact on the world, that means that I don't have an impact on the world. And so I, I left Motorola and went back to academia to get my doctorate. Uh, to move into the medical space, because uh, I, I wanted to feel like I was having an impact. Uh, and when I read that article, the same feeling came over me, and I felt like I've been doing this for about two and a half years, and coming to these sorts of conferences and talking about how awesome open data is, and, and it's going to save lives, and it's going to you know, solve world hunger, and, and fix the homeless. I said, we really need to do a gut check on what we're doing here. And are we actually having the impact that we think we're having? I'm a true believer in open data as a uh, reformed computer scientist. Um, I'm a true believer in the power of data and algorithms. And I believe we're in the right space, so I won't be moving out of this space anytime soon. But then it, the question comes, how do we ensure the maximum impact? Right? So today is uh, New York City's fifth year anniversary of the open data law. Uh, uh, that uh, Moda is proud to say that we're a part of the open data team that uh, uh, encompasses Moda, the Mayor's Office of Data and Analytics. I run Moda uh, and do it. Uh, there's some folks from awesome folks from Do It here, Ralph and Albert. Uh, Department of Information Technology and Trans, uh, 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 Telecommunications in New York City, and the Open Data Coordinators, ODCs, and those are the people at the agencies who we work with. And together we comprise uh, the Open Data team. Today is our fifth anniversary of the passing of one of the most robust and profound open data laws uh, in the world, um, and we celebrate that. And by celebrating that, we've um, released uh, a new open data website for external engagement, and I'll get into that a little bit. I don't want to presume that people know what Moda is, um, so I, I put in a couple of slides really quick. Um, that's, that's me at the top that they're referring to. Um, actionable insight for New York City government, uh, support for effective delivery of services to New Yorkers for greater equity, safety, and quality of life, and then we also grow analytics uh, capabilities throughout the city. So here's how we think about problems and challenges at Moda. Um, there's data management challenges in the city, decision support challenges, and operational analytics. And we live anywhere in that triangle. Um, and we take on projects across the city. The way I like to describe Moda is that we're a no-cost analytics consulting firm to the city of New York. So either the mayor, um, city leadership, uh, heads of agencies, chiefs of staff are our clients. And they reach out to us on a daily basis. Uh, and ask us to 
partner with them to take on projects to help them uh, do their job uh, more efficiently. Two seconds, here's two projects that we've worked on within the last year. Uh, we worked with uh, New York City Commission on Human Rights uh, to do an analytic to identify where uh, income uh, uh, discrimination is happening in New York City. In New York City, uh, you can get, uh, like other cities, you can get uh, what's referred to as a Section 8 voucher, which is a voucher that subsidizes your housing. Uh, essentially, if you're on public assistance, you, you're uh, able to get a Section 8 voucher. The problem is there's all sorts of stigmas and stereotypes uh, painted on people who have Section 8 vouchers, so when they go to rent an apartment, uh, that landlord uh, may make decisions based on whether or not um, they have a Section 8 voucher, and that's illegal in New York City. And the Commissioner of Human Rights uh, 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 tapped us and said, the way we know when that happens is when it happens and someone reports it to us, so it's after the fact. So how can we begin to think about where these things are happening in New York City such that we can be proactive in ensuring uh, that uh, uh, people have uh, the appropriate uh, type of housing, all, all people in New York City. And so we worked on a project with them. Another project, you, 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 there's a, threat, a, a consistent thread here. New York City, uh, housing is big to do. You know, it's like um, very expensive in New York City to find housing. So then you're trying to find housing for everyone in New York City, not, not, not just uh, uh, the people in uh, FinTech, right? <clears throat> And so this other one is uh, in rent sustained uh, units in New York City. Uh, landlords, uh, in some cases, uh, illegally harass tenants in order to get them out such that they can raise uh, the cost of the rent in that unit. Uh, and we worked with um, a tenant harassment task force that included housing preservation and development, uh, Department of Buildings and New York State Attorney General's Office because rent sustained, sustained units are managed by the state. Uh, and they created a task force and then they asked us to be sort of their data and analytics arm and essentially give them uh, a list of uh, 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 landlords in New York City who uh, uh, are worthy of investigation. We did, I'm not gonna go into the full analytics project, but I wanted to kind of share how we think about analytics. When I started as the head of MOTA, as a chief analytics officer for the city of New York, uh, I said, you know, I came uh, from the software engineering background, I said we're going to use sort of an agile uh, mechanism, and that is um, user-centered analytics. And I like to say that at Moda, we don't sharpen a pencil at Moda unless we know the New Yorker that it's going to impact. Right? So we don't make a move, we don't take a project point blank if it's not going to be in some way, shape, or form impactful to a New Yorker. We don't do things for fun. So we also, as the chief analytics officer, I also have a purview, and I talked about the open data team. Uh, we partner with Doit uh, as a leader to, uh, across the city to implement open data. And so what we decided to do was look at how do we take, how we take on analytics projects in a meaningful way and apply that to open data. And so these are our open data values. Start with users, encourage purposeful engagement, empower agencies, treat publishing a data set as its debut, integrate open data into citywide processes, learn, test, standardize, and learn again. And that's how we do open data. So essentially, I've said this before and I'll say it again, for us, open data is not a noun, it's a verb. It's what you do on a daily basis to ensure that that data uh, is impactful is used, is engaged in the right way. It's all of the pieces you put around that actual data set, right? But that wasn't enough because recently we've been asking ourselves, is open data really open? I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a, as I do with most conferences I go to, I have a stack of business cards in my back pocket Let's say if Kevin said, everyone here, make your business cards uh, uh, available and open so everyone you know, walking around can grab a business card. What if I took my business card, went downstairs or downstairs to National Pastime, went to the far right corner of National Pastime and put my business cards on the floor right down there? I made them open and available. They're no longer with me. They're not in my possession anymore. Will anybody here get access to those business cards? Highly unlikely, right? But I can still make the case to Kevin, say, I, I did what you asked me to do. 
I made them available. They're not in my possession. I made them open. But the people that we meant for them to, 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 to the people who were meant to have them don't get access to them. So think about that in context to open data. An analogy I used to use and I still use every now and then is this concept of uh, uh, open data truck, I call it. If I took a truck and I loaded it up with open data and I drove it into midtown Manhattan where Civic Hall is and all of the startups and uh, Silicon Alley and all of the fancy hackers and so on and so forth, the NYU students and Columbia students, and I drove it right smack dab into the middle of Manhattan. I opened up the back of the truck and I said, come and get your open data. A lot of people would dig in, right? If I took that same truck, loaded it up with the same data, and drove it to the South Bronx, Harlem, certain pieces of Brooklyn, certain parts of Brooklyn, and did the same thing, opened up the truck and said, open data for everyone, highly unlikely you would have the same reaction. Highly unlikely. And I say highly unlikely, I have tons of anecdotal stories. I had a, 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 a group of university students come to my office, not students, excuse me, faculty actually, department chair of a big data and predictive analytics department at a university came to my office to talk to me. This was about, I was about four or five months into the job. Talk to them, talk, talking about partnering and so on and so forth. I said, so what are your thoughts on open data? And the open data portal, I want to get some good feedback. I didn't know, uh, I, didn't, I hadn't spent much time with Socrata and so on and so forth at that point in time. So I was looking to see, get some user feedback. Faculty heads department chair of this department. What's open data? Never heard of, this is a university. What's open data? Never heard of it. Well, what do you guys use to do your research? Census data, federal government website. New York City has open data, are you kidding? Right? So we spent, we went to that university and spent two years lecturing them, not talking to them about open data. <laughs> we did a lecture. I'm also a reformed faculty member, so I use the term lecture. Uh, endearingly. So what we did, and Socrata as a partner on this has been excellent. Socrata, and I always love to give a shout out to Claire and Tyler uh, whenever I uh, do these talks because those folks, I know they probably both changed their numbers uh, since uh, uh, this sprint we went on with them. So we wanted to understand who are the users in New York City. We also went through every single comment that had been put on New York City's open data portal from when we stood up the Socrata portal. So before I even started, we went through every single comment and we put a typology to it. Because so I wanted to know who's accessing the data and for what reasons, historically. We also partnered with CUSP, NYU CUSP. Um, um, CUS uh, stands for Center of USP. That was a joke. <laughs> uh, Urban Science and Progress. Um, and we partnered with them to identify, uh, do a capstone, a research project on data poverty. And what we define as data poverty is uh, limited access, engagement, and limited ability to see representation of you in the data Therefore, you will likely not engage with the data that's on Open Data Portal. And so we wanted to find out if we can build a metric, do an analysis of what neighborhoods and what people in New York City were experiencing data poverty. The inability to engage with uh, 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 the things that will cause you not to engage with open data. And so we built out, uh, uh, did an analysis of that. And there's a full uh, paper online on the open data uh, website uh, that you can read. We also partnered with Columbia SEPA to identify which um, uh, 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 community-based organizations, nonprofits, were using open data to help serve their constituents. And we also, I'm trying to use the most appropriate word here, but we were engaged by city council um, to implement these new seven laws on top of the original open data law. And so city council jumped in the fray uh, to help us uh, uh, be more robust, um, be more specific, and be more impactful. 
Right. And so these were um, the, the seven new laws that now we as an open data team are tasked with implementing. And here's a couple of, um, like I said, today is the anniversary of the New York City's open data law. Shout out to all of the people in New York City who were uh, live streaming. I think this is being live streamed, right? No? Okay. It is. So now I don't seem uh, silly. Um, <laughs> We have a new website. We're also doing a, a, a data literacy initiative, uh, and we're partnering with um, Parks Department. But it's still not enough. It's still not enough. So I'm going to do something that you don't hear from many uh, city officials, New York City officials, when they come to events like this. We're coming with our hat in hand uh, to this community, this open data community that Socrata um, has graciously um, convened. We're coming hat in hand to engage you guys to figure out what can we do more? What should be the next steps? We can't do this alone. Um, we want to partner with you guys. We want to engage the community to know where we can go to be more impactful. I mean, again, I love, uh, my team knows this. Um, I'm a very simple person, not a complex thinker in any way, shape, or form, so I love analogies. And where have we seen this before? I was thinking about this. We've seen this problem before. I know Doug is back there, so I don't know if Doug, uh, you know, that's, I'm not even gonna put Doug on the spot. He's a police officer, so I don't know if he has his gun with him or not, so I'm not gonna put Doug on the spot. But um, that's Mega Evers College. Mega Evers College is a community college in Brooklyn, New York. The history of this community college is all across Chicago, uh, uh, Philadelphia, tons of cities across the nation are community colleges. Community colleges were created because there was a need to serve uh, people in the community and provide for them access and ability for higher uh, education. So take a New York City, is NYU, and Columbia University. Chicago has University of Chicago. Baltimore has Johns Hopkins University. All of them smack dab in the middle of uh, the urban environment. Smack dab in the middle of, of communities that suffer from uh, all sorts of socioeconomic challenges. And you have the world's top universities. And in each one of those universities, the community that surrounds it does not have the same access uh, and ability to engage those universities. I was a postdoc at University of Chicago, so I know. I was a research scientist at Johns Hopkins, so I know. And I'm currently adjunct faculty at NYU, so I know. The communities are not being served appropriately by these top universities. So the advent of community colleges came in and said, listen, we will create courses that are appropriate to you. We will teach the courses in the evening such that you can take care of your children during the day and, and, and work during the day so that you can support your families, but then you can come to school at night and get that advanced degree in nursing, uh, community activism, and so on and so forth. So they created a mechanism to serve uh, a constituency that wasn't getting served by the biggest, fanciest, most uh, 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 expansive universities in the world. There was a need for community colleges. New York Times just did an article a few weeks ago about the uh, success of community colleges across the nation. How were community colleges created? Through government leadership, community act advocacy, and legislative action. It sounds familiar, doesn't it, Ralph and Albert? That's how the open data law in New York City was created. But where we are, where we are now is, how do we get the open data portal and the open data world to those communities. Community colleges were built to bring higher education to the communities. You couldn't just stand it up and say, well, everyone come, because here, it's right smack dab in, your, in the middle of your community, come. You had to bring it to them. So that's the next step. Bring open data to the communities. So here's, here's what I think we can do. It's my suggestions. And I really am serious about engaging this uh, full community. The, I played baseball uh, in undergrad, and I was on the phone with a reporter yesterday, and he, 
I, I talked about my baseball career at School of Data in New York City, and he was giving me, uh, uh, he was giving me crap about that I used to play baseball in uh, undergrad, Division II baseball. And I was like, why is that like a big deal for people, you know, I guess it's a big deal when techies play sports or something like that. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I've lived my life, I'm a big lover of baseball. I've lived my life loving sports and appreciating things that you can learn from sports. As I've gotten older and less athletic, I've taken up golf. <laughs> and I love the concept of the PGA Tour. If you actually go to the website and you look at um, the, the, the mission of the PGA, it's to have an impact in the communities that they play in and to grow the game of golf. We should be having, as open data implementers, impact in the communities that we're in and growing the world of open data, right? And so I see, you know, where PGA Tour is really this group of players who come together and they travel around the world and they play, they compete against each other, but ultimately moving the game and the sport forward and being impactful in the communities that they play. And that's what I believe that we should be doing. We should no longer be um, in a space where everybody is left up to their own to move forward. Because what happens is, you know, we start wringing our hands around things like, well, there seems to be no data on whitehouse.gov slash data and what happened to that and so on and so forth because everybody is left up to their own devices uh, to make decisions on open data. We should be a community. We should be thinking as a community. Um, but again, we don't have to all think the same. And that's why the PGA Tour is really important about this is because Tiger Woods doesn't use, well, he's a bad example. I would have used him like five years ago. Um, Jordan Spieth doesn't use the same clubs, balls, gear, style of swing um, as anyone else. And they, all can, they all compete and they use what they, they need to get them uh, further, but they understand that we're all in this together and we're moving the state of the art and the communities together. And I think that's what we should do. Second, um, I'm gonna make an announcement today that moving forward, that this will be my last uh, talk uh, publicly uh, about open data uh, in any forum um, on a stage by myself. I'll sit on panels to talk about the academic uh, capabilities and qualities of open data, but I won't be doing any more speeches on open data publicly. Uh, even more so, I certainly won't be at next year's conference. Because what I'm committing to this community and everyone that's watching is that the next person that represents New York City to talk about open data is gonna be someone who's been impacted by open data. So I won't be up here selling the virtues and values of open data. It will be someone today, today who does not know that open data exists, but a year from now will tell you how New York City, the open data team, and the people in New York City engage them, show them what open data was, and now that they're better for it. They've learned from it. They can do some things that they didn't know that they could do with open data. It's not my job to sell what's awesome. If it was, I'd be up here selling donut-powered jetpacks, because that's awesome. My job is to help New Yorkers and impact New Yorkers so that they can help themselves and be better New Yorkers. Um, and I hope that um, the community um, will stand with me um, in that declaration. I think it'll actually make for a uh, way more fun uh, uh, a conference. I'm no fun, so I know anyone else who comes in my stead will be way more, way more fun. Uh, and the, lastly, I just wanted to say from that standpoint, uh, we lead with people so that they can become leaders with data. Data is important, and being able to lead with data is extremely important, but we also want to state that we lead with people so that they can become leaders with data, uh, and that's extremely important, because then when I'm no longer in this position, um, the show moves uh, aggressively and continuously. Thank you very much. Thank you.